Hello everybody, welcome to another Wednesday video, and this time we're going to be talking about a rather interesting subject. This is part of an ongoing look we've got at the American Civil War, but we're not actually going to be looking at the coast or the oceans, although it still has a naval theme, because we're going to be looking at the Riverine Warfare which is slightly different in, in many ways, most of which we're probably going to find out in the next hour or so. So I'm joined today by uh, a special guest who has much knowledge to impart about this. Perhaps you'd like to say hello. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is uh, Sean Michael Chick, and uh, I'm the author of a book on the Battle of Petersburg, and a lot of my work right now has to do with Army-Navy cooperation on the rivers, which is why I was interested in getting involved in this. Mm-hmm. So, yep, the, the American Civil War has plenty of information to study, and, uh, well, being yeah. based across across in the UK, I don't have anywhere near the same amount of access that uh, American researchers do, so it's just as well that uh, people like yourself are around. Yeah. <laughs> and also, yeah, the thing I'd probably uh, like to start off uh, talking about is the rivers are going to be most important during conflict, I think. Uh, now, there are a number of these, but there's really going to be about five that are key. The most important one, of course, is going to be the Mississippi River, and that's where you're going to see most of your action, and understandably so. You know, third or fourth longest river in the world by any, uh, by, you know, certain metrics, uh, essentially cuts the United States into two pieces, if you will, and therefore cuts the Confederacy into two pieces. So the Confederates understand they have to maintain the river to keep the two sides together. It's also very important for commerce. Now, Confederate commerce wasn't as much based on shipping stuff from Memphis to New Orleans. It was before the Civil War because you're trying to ship cotton out through the Port of New Orleans. And keep in mind, too, the Port of New Orleans is the fourth busiest port in the world in 1860, and by some measurements had as many, if not more, banks than New York City, so major commercial center. But when the war starts, you have the Union blockade, which was fairly effective at the mouth of Mississippi. And then you also have the King Cotton diplomacy, where the Confederates were not going to ship their cotton out. So the river traffic for the Confederacy on the Mississippi River, while not unimportant, is not as central as it was in the antebellum period. What's more important is access to the Trans-Mississippi Theater. Trans-Mississippi is one of the Confederacy's main sources of beef. And, and then salt as well. So you want to be able to ship those things over, which leads to another important river, the Red River. The Red River cuts through a lot of Western Louisiana, going all the way from Mississippi, past Alexandria, and then to Shreveport. And this river is a major transportation hub and is the main way that you ship goods from the Western theater to uh, the states to the east. So the Mississippi and the Red River will see a lot of action, especially Mississippi. That said, I would say the other three important rivers are the Tennessee, the Cumberland, and the James. The Tennessee in particular is important because it cuts through the state of Tennessee and Kentucky, dividing them into two pieces. Uh, so controlling that river will allow you to really interrupt Confederate movements and communications. The Cumberland is mostly just important as a defensive barrier between Tennessee and Kentucky, but especially because whoever controls the Cumberland controls Nashville. And Nashville, while not as important as New Orleans, is an important manufacturing and railroad center. And then there's the James River. The James River to me is one of the most interesting ones because the river is very strange in a way. What happens is, is that uh, you have this river that's kind of it's not a particularly long one. It goes by Richmond, Virginia, which, of course, is the capital of the Confederacy, major manufacturing center. The capture of Richmond would be a catastrophic blow to the Confederacy. I would argue fatal. The river then widens considerably, becoming almost like a lake, if you will, as it goes towards the ocean. And that means that control of this river is uh, going to be one of the more interesting topics when we get into it. But yeah, the, the James River is fascinating because... It's not a particularly long or famous river, but if the Confederates happen to have lost control of it, I don't see them recovering from those consequences. So those are your five main um, river theaters, if you will. Mm -hmm. Okay, so as with uh, most of the other videos of this type that we've done, we're going to run it with effectively me asking some questions and most of the information coming from the special guest. So with that in mind, 
and uh, the, these key operational river theaters. Was riverine warfare in the American Civil War an outgrowth of the seaborne and coastal war, or was it very much its own thing developmentally? Very much its own thing de developmentally. Uh, relatively early on, Union generals realize they need to control these rivers. The Mississippi becomes the most obvious one. General Winfield Scott argued for control for a, a campaign in the Mississippi River. He was the first head of the U.S. Army when the war starts. General McClellan, who replaced him before he even became head of the um, Union Army, was already authorizing the construction of warships for the rivers. Now, the Union very early on cut off trade and traffic on the Mississippi through Cairo, Illinois. It looks like Cairo. That's how you would pronounce it anywhere else. But in Illinois, they were pronouncing Cairo. <laughs> and <laughs> you're essentially going to have them, the Union is going to, I mean, both sides are going to do this. I'll get to the Confederates in a bit. But the Union is going to construct, is going to buy a series of civilian ships and upgrade them for military use. They vary quite a bit. Some of them are literally just tugboats with cannons on them. Like, I'm, I don't even mean naval artillery. I'm talking like field cannons like you'd see in a battle. Those are just patrol boats, really. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, kind of other ones are going to upgrade with armor, such as the timber clads, and then they start building iron clads as well. Uh, so, yeah, very, very much uh, decided by the military. Um, in fact, the army controlled the ships for a period of time in 1861 until the Navy took control. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Okay, so... Bearing that in mind, was there any crossover from the naval sort of the naval side, as in coastal and and oceanic operations, to river operations? Did the two interact, or were they completely separate? No, though they very much interacted on the not on the Tennessee, Cumberland, or Red Rivers as much because those are interior rivers. But your Mississippi and James River do go into the ocean, and your James River fleet is going to be an ocean-going fleet for the most part. Now, maybe not open ocean. Some of them, of course, are those tugboats, like I mentioned earlier. But uh, for instance, 1864, your largest concentration of Union monitors is going to be on the James River, which uh, you can go to the Library of Congress and type in any number of monitor uh, images there. If you're like, oh, I want to see what the, uh, you know, what the, uh, whew, what's that one, uh, USS, um, I can't even pronounce the name. It says it's a Kowak or something. It's... Mm -hmm. um, you can type that one in, and then you'll get about five or six different images of it, and it's all in the James River. And you'll have an entire line of these monitors as well. Great, great pictures to look at. But anyway, so the Mississippi is especially important because they're trying to go after New Orleans. And you know, New Orleans being the biggest city in the South, being the biggest cities on the continent at that time, has to be captured. And they're going to try to do it from the ocean side. And they're going to have Admiral Farragut's fleet, which is going to be working not only with the capture of New Orleans, but then operates with these ocean-going vessels along the Mississippi River. Uh, Port Hudson, Vicksburg, and a variety of other operations as well. But for the most part, and especially if you're talking, you know, the uh, Mississippi River to the north, and of course Tennessee and Cumberland, that's all river-based uh, ships in particular. Okay. And... Obviously, we've mentioned the, the the five major rivers that are involved. In terms of the major theaters of operation, was that defined by kind of the entire river, or were there major theaters of operation along some of those rivers, like, say, the Mississippi, that were almost separate from each other? Do you mean, like, separate rivers, if you will? Or, or do you mean... If you had, like, a southern Mississippi operational area and northern Mississippi operational area, or would it have just been the Mississippi flotilla and it just happens to go wherever it's needed? Oh, no, no. They they definitely have a separate... Well, okay. For the Mississippi, you do have a separate flotilla. That's your uh, western uh, flotilla. And the actual the western flotilla works the Mississippi, the Tennessee, and the Cumberland. They work all three of those rivers. Coming from the south, of course, would be Farragut's fleet. Given the geography, both those fleets are for a large, large period of time working independent of each other. So some coordination issues there for sure. Uh, but yeah, the Union wanted their river fleet, at least Mississippi, Tennessee, and Cumberland, to be almost interchangeable. So you could move ships from one crisis point to another or wherever you're doing offensive operations. Uh, the Red River, by the way, is not one that they want to go up and down too much because... The Red River 
is in many places very shallow. In fact, the Union actually almost lost a fleet because of the waters falling on the Red River. And the Red River was also, yeah, the Red River is also given to obstructions too. So for instance, uh, the name Shreveport refers to Captain Shreve, who was the man who cleared the Red River. And I remember I had this Louisiana history textbook growing up and had this like big painting of him in the book on top of these logs, like clearing off logs. I think he was staring at you and pointing at you too, like I'm the man. And I say this because he was kind of like a Louisiana frontier hero, but that really tells you about the Red River being a hard river to navigate in many ways. But yeah, they, the Union almost lost a large portion of its river fleet on the Red River in 1864 because the water levels were dropping. Yeah, then obviously, well, ships that are stranded in the mud, A, have a tendency, annoying tendency to topple over, and B, even if they don't, they make very, very inviting targets for infantry. Yeah, exactly. And of course, the Confederates are thinking like, all right, cool, guys, we can get a river fleet now. <laughs> <laughs> One fleet slightly used. Um <laughs> Yeah, they, they only escaped because of a dam that was set up by a gentleman named Bailey. And fun fact, if you go to uh, the Wisconsin State Capitol, there's a giant painting of him in the room, and it shows the ships escaping the Red River behind him. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so speaking of the ships, so what kind of ships were used? I mean, we've talked about that very briefly, but... Were they particularly large ships? Were they small ships? Um, I know we've said there's some ironclads, but what was kind of the balance? Was it a lot of small wooden patrol ships and a few ironclads, or did they have some sort of some of these big paddle wheel steamers fitted out as sort of miniature river dreadnought kind of things? What what was the composition of these river fleets? Well, your um, your offensive punch is for the Union is going to be the ironclads. And the main one is going to be what's called the city class ironclads. So that would be ones like the um, uh, Cincinnati, Carondelet, St. Louis, Cairo. Those were around 500 ton warships. Uh, keep in mind that these are river ironclads, so they're quite new. So, in many ways, they're very good because. You know, the Confederates have to also learn how to deal with them, which they do. We'll get to that in a bit. But, you know, the Confederates have to figure out how to deal with these ships. And they're fairly well armored for the time. But it is uncharted territory. So the ships had some flaws. For instance, they're not very well compartmentalized. So any kind of damage they take, particularly underwater damage from torpedoes, which we call mines today. Uh, the, they sank two of them, at least, the Baron de Kalb and the Cairo. Mm hmm and they weren't armored on the top, and I believe they were not armored on the stern either, although that's not quite as important. Oh, another thing to keep in mind, too, especially when I was reading about Fort Henry and especially Fort Donaldson, there's a tendency for these ships to lose steering under fire. <laughs> and, yeah, so I mean, they're, no, they're, they're very useful warships. They're very effective, but they are the first of their kind, so there are a lot of design flaws with them that just kind of go with the territory. Beyond that, you have your armed tugboats and lighter vessels. And then you have the timber clads. Those were kind of the, uh, the intermediaries between the gunboats and the, and the, um, and the iron clads. And a timber clad is essentially just one of these that just has uh, lots of wooden armor on them. Uh, two of the most famous ones are the Tyler and the Lexington, who both offer direct naval support during the Battle of Shiloh. Uh, timber clads were fragile if you tried to throw them up against heavy entrenched cannons. But they're fairly strong warships, and they could, they could handle themselves against Confederate field artillery. Uh, the Confederates, if the Confederates came under five or timber clad of its Confederate infantry force, they typically are going to fall back. They're not going to try to duke it out with it. So kind of think of it as your medium class warship, if you will. Yeah. The, was, yeah. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, no, it's, it's um, I suppose it makes sense in that ships historically are always able to carry much heavier artillery than you're generally going to be able to push around on land. So even if yes. you've got Confederate troops with their own organic artillery, the chances of them having artillery that can match a relatively decent sized ship is probably pretty slim. Yeah. And the the Confederates would try against the timberclads at first, didn't have much much effectiveness. Now Confederates did have success with their artillery on the rivers against the lighter warships. And that was a very common tactic. You'd have a, a column of cavalry with one or two batteries of horse artillery. You place it somewhere on the river. You see a light warship going by or just a lone transport, open fire. 
Also, you could take them down with uh, various skirmishers because while the rifled musket wasn't the revolutionary piece of weaponry that old historiography said it was, it is still much better for sniping than a smooth bore. So the effectiveness of Confederate artillery and infantry against the lighter warships and transports is considerable. And a number of those are going to be captured and destroyed during the war. Rarely enough for it to be critical, but enough for it to be a nuisance to where the Union has to keep ships patrolling on the rivers. But yeah, when you mention that, but the, but the artillery being heavier, with the Battle of Shiloh, uh, reading through the accounts, the Confederates constantly talk about coming under naval gunfire, and their reactions to it varied a lot. Some of them said like, oh, it barely hit us, who cared? It was just really loud. And other ones would say, you know, I was freaked out. I saw a shell hit a guy and just blow him to smithereens. Uh, one account I saw was a piece of naval artillery hit a tree, and then the tree flattened. I want to say like the guy said it flattened like 12 men or something ridiculous. So it all depended on where you were taking that gunfire. But one I liked in particular, one Confederate soldier at Shiloh called the naval gunfire. He said at nighttime, it looked like arcs of lightning. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they, they don't they don't say that for their field artillery. Which, <laughs> no. It's going to say it for the naval guns, you know? Yeah. Uh, well, I suppose that, that bears out across the whole, this whole 19th century time period where you've got naval artillery either coming into close contact or in some cases even being dismounted. Um, I, I'm, I'm immediately drawn to a comparison in, in one of the Boer Wars where one of the British cruisers dismounted some of its, some of its naval artillery and, and wheeled that across the land and everybody's fighting with sort of 12 pounders and maybe the odd 24 pounder and then along comes effectively half a cruiser's worth of guns all at considerably Damn. greater <laughs> can break a greater caliber oh. but they're just like hello <laughs> we own this place now <laughs> yeah you mentioned that the 24 pound thing the uh, mm. you run to that occasionally they'll have a 12 24 pound um artillery in the civil war and they'll of course mention that as like oh that's a big loud piece of guns usually used for siege work you know but damn a mm. cruiser's worth of guns <laughs> oh my yeah. god <laughs> the uh i would mention the confederates and their ships the mm -hmm. confederates of course have a problem they do not have the industrial base that the union has now one thing should be kept in mind the confederates do have an industrial base in fact i remember reading uh years back uh economic an article about the ec economics of the war that pointed out that while the Union had a major advantage in manufacturing and railroads, it should be kept in mind the Confederacy, when it's formed, is roughly the fifth most industrialized country in the world. And while the railroad network wasn't as good in the 1850s, they had built up a much more extensive one than they had before. So it should be kept in mind the Confederates can build things, definitely. They just can't do it the way the Union can. I think... A if if my reading is right, a lot of the Confederate stuff was kind of almost don't might quite want to say sort of sh built in a cottage shed kind of thing, but it was sort of we need a thing of roughly this capability, and whoever's on on the ground in that area is going to have to build it. So you end up with a lot of one offs and odd ships here and there, some of which are quite capable, some of which not so much. Whereas with the Union, they're able to just go right. We've, we've designed this thing, and this works relatively well. We will now build a dozen. Yes, um, the Union has a much more standardized thing. And like you said, Confederate quality varies. There was a general belief by Secretary of the Navy uh, Stephen Mallory that the Confederates should build ironclads. He jumps on this in some ways arguably a little faster than the Union does. But his idea is that Confederate ironclads must be heavily armed. He said, we've got to have, we've got to favor... Uh, firepower quality, if you will, or just weight of shell over quantity. And while, so the Confederates for the most part did build not just ironclads, but some pretty powerful ironclads, uh, such as CSS Tennessee, the one that was defending Mobile Bay, Virginia, of course. Uh, but that quality thing you mentioned is very important. So let's look at New Orleans. Mm -hmm. New Orleans has the most extensive dry dock facilities in the country. It actually didn't build ships. Had a lot of stuff to repair, not a lot to build. Now you can convert that over, but Confederate experience, New Orleans experience, if you will, is not about really building ships as much. So in New Orleans, very early on, you take a series of civilian ships, you convert those to military use. The Union did the same thing. What the Confederates would tend to do with those is 
put cotton on board them. So they called them cotton clads. And the idea was that the cotton clad, the cotton would absorb the hits, and then you'd get in close and typically ram the other ship and try to board it, or at least have your uh, your infantry on the boat knock out theirs through sniper fire. The other idea, of course, was to build ironclads, and they will try to build three of them in New Orleans. One of them does get finished, the CSS Manassas, uh, which is kind of like this turtle-like ship, very odd. It only had one cannon, though, but it's uh, it's an effective little ship. Yeah. Uh, but then they decided to build these two massive ironclads, the Mississippi and Louisiana. And these are not capable of um, getting the job done. They do not have the right propulsion system, especially the Louisiana. Uh, and some of that was because they hired civilians who didn't have a lot of military experience. And they really didn't know what they were building. They were kind of building ships that were essentially civilian ships that happened to have cannons on them and iron plating. <laughs> now, in the, in the case of the Louisiana, very quickly the Confederates realized, oh my God, we've commissioned a ship that doesn't work. They use it as a floating battery at Fort St. Philip. The CSS Mississippi, interestingly enough, there was sabotage on the Mississippi. Um, so the ship was delayed. There was, uh, there was also a um, labor strike over it as well. Now, Admiral Farragut believed from what he had read about the Mississippi that if that ship had been ready, he could not have taken New Orleans. But more contemporary research has shown that the CSS Mississippi, while better than Louisiana, wasn't much better. And so one of the reasons that they have problems with New Orleans, not only is the fact that both neither one of these ships are ready by the time the Union fleet arrives, both of them probably couldn't have been effective anyway. But then you have like the CSS Arkansas, which is a very, very good ironclad overall. The Albemarle, um, another very effective one. So yeah, Confederate quality really is all over the place. Okay, so with uh, with that bearing in mind, with the sort of the ships that we're talking about, what, or if any, were features that we find unique to the Riverine navies on both sides? Um, I suppose, especially when we're talking about ironclads, but some of the other ships as well, that you didn't find in the coastal and ocean-going equivalents. I mean, apart from that, I presume most of the Riverine ships had fairly shallow draft for obvious reasons. Oh, yeah. Shallow draft. Uh, of course, you're not dealing with sails. Everything's steam-powered. Uh, that plays a very important role in how these battles are going to be fought. Ironclads, of course, are common up front. Uh, there's also the experimentation with rams. Both the Confederate and the Union use those. And there's the interesting naval battle of Memphis, which is a battle between rams. Mm -hmm. uh, the Union ram fleet gets the better of it. Just better <laughs> ships, better leadership. I think, God, I think at the battle of Memphis, the Union only lost one guy, and it was the commander of the fleet, which was uh, Ellet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> little careless. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so, um, those are some of the more uh, unique features to those ships in particular. Um, there's not going to be, at least at that time, from what I can tell, a ton of design crossover between river and ocean-going ships. Um, this is also probably when almost all of these ships were decommissioned right after the conflict and sold off to uh, for uh, commercial purposes. You know, some of them are turning right back to what they had done before the war. You know, just various transport roles. Yeah, I'm particularly interested interested by the idea of that sort of ba the Battle of Memphis with all the all the rams running around. Yeah, and the, I I will confess it's one I don't know a ton about, but I do know the Confederates did not want to be there. They were there because mm. they were having uh, essentially fuel problems. Okay, well, I suppose it also makes it, it makes a certain amount of sense when you're talking about uh, the two sides, because as we said, the con the Confederates have problems making standardized ships, and also obviously large numbers of ships and if you're going to end up in a melee fight that's probably one of the areas where having large numbers of ships matters the most so it's probably yeah. the, the worst environment possible if you're going to be a confederate fleet yeah the if memphis there was eight ships versus eight ships but the confederate ones just they're inferior by comparison for the most part um once again, they got the fuel problems as well. What they wanted to do was get away from Memphis and uh, get to Vicksburg. You know, fortified position where your fleet will be safe and you can also help the defenders out as well. You know, in fact, one of the reasons they don't want to fight over Memphis is the fate of Memphis has already been decided. Corinth, Mississippi has fallen. 
So the Confederates can't effectively hold the city anyway. You mm -hmm. know? Yeah, it's, it's really, it's not so much a battle for the fate of Memphis as it is a battle about, will these ships get away? <laughs> or if we're going yeah. to be sunk, we at least take down some Union ships with us. The answer is definitely no. No. <laughs> yeah. So, obviously, rivers have boundaries that are fairly obvious, although I suppose with the size of the Mississippi, you might sometimes forget that there's a river bank um, in places. <laughs> So how, how much cooperation was there between the Riverine navies and the various armies that they were theoretically supposed to be supporting? I know you said, obviously, that theoretically these ships are mostly under the control of the army itself. But did in practice, was, was that the case? Did they kind of cooperate with the troops or was it sort of a circumstance of, well, we've, we've sent our Riverine navy on this offensive and the army's theoretically doing this offensive, but you might end up with the army showing up and wondering where the, the the river ships have gotten to, or vice versa, the river ships get somewhere and suddenly find themselves surrounded on both sides by enemy troops. Yes, this is a great question. A lot of this has to do with personalities. Now, not that contemporary warfare isn't influenced by personalities, it always will be, but you find in, the, uh, in this era of warfare that personality goes a long way. So how well does the army and the naval commanders work together? Uh, I will have to say the Union, for the most part, had good coordination, but it will depend on the personnel is involved. So let's mention for your main river admirals, if you will. You have, mm -hmm. on the Mississippi, Tennessee, and Cumberland early, you have Admiral Andrew Foote. Uh, so Foote's one of your first guys using the, uh, he's going to be your first guy to use the ironclad river ships in combat. The, the uh, city class does very well. He works well with the Army commanders, particularly Lysses S. Grant. And then, of course, Fort Henry, Fort Donaldson are captured. Island number 10 will be taken as well. Andrew Foote, uh, I believe, then became ill. I know he was suffering depression around the time of Island number 10, some family tragedy, so he gets shuffled off. Now, coming in from the south is Admiral Farragut, whose second in command is Admiral Porter. Uh, Farragut is rightfully considered the best admiral the Union has and the most famous one. But everybody's got a weakness, unless you're Alexander the Great, I think. Everybody has some weakness as a commander, and Farragut says that he actually doesn't work well with the army compared to the other ones. Now, some of this is probably because he was paired up working with first Benjamin Butler and then Nathaniel Banks. I would argue Nathaniel Banks might is the worst general in American history. <laughs> I mean, the guy just can't <laughs> win a battle. <laughs> um, so he, to be fair to Farragut, he's not working with the A team at all, not even the C team. And in the case of New Orleans, he effectively saw that his ships had taken the city. So he moved on and took Natchez and Baton Rouge. He then goes to Vicksburg. He does, he's not able to take Vicksburg. And why? Because when he gets to Vicksburg, he finds the bluffs are taller than he was led to believe. The Confederates are already mounting guns. They have a decent garrison there, and they're already fortifying the position. Now, if he had taken soldiers with him, he could have done it. Vicksburg at that time was not as heavily defended, but he had moved away from Butler. And Butler complained at the time and afterwards that Farragut failed to work with him on the capture of Vicksburg in 1862. Uh, Farragut arguably had a worse relationship with Banks, who replaced Butler. Uh, but to be fair, like, for instance, when Farragut runs the guns at Port Hudson in March 1863, Banks leads a, um, a diversion, a kind of a feint against Port Hudson. And, uh, you know, he, he, he does his role as well as he can. It doesn't matter, though. The gunners at Port Hudson are waiting for Farragut. They manage to sink the USS Mississippi, heavily damaged a number of other warships. And Banks and Farragut just didn't particularly get along, and they weren't able to coordinate as well. Now, it didn't mean they couldn't do any kind of coordination. It just not as smooth as it could be. But the other one is Porter. And Porter's interesting. Um, even Porter's friends and allies thought he was arrogant and a liar. Uh, and Porter in particular did not like political generals. And a wonderful example of that is Arkansas Post. That was uh, what happened is the uh, Union tried to take Vicksburg in December 1862. They failed. John McClernand, who was the general on the spot, a political general, decided he wanted to go after Arkansas Post. 
It was a successful operation, but Porter gave all the credit to McClernand's second in command, William Tecumseh Sherman. And that's simply because uh, he didn't like political generals. And at the same time, McClernand was on the outs with Ulysses S. Grant, and Porter was friends with Grant. That's also a very important thing to keep in mind. I mean, same as today, same as always, cliques are extremely important. And in the Civil War, that's one of the more underappreciated things. So how one guy felt about you will determine how this other guy is going to feel about you. It happens constantly. So, But that said, I think the Porter case is also illustrative. Even though he didn't like McClernand, he carried out his role in the operation faithfully. Arkansas Post is a success. The garrison is captured. Another one, though, that I think is interesting that I uh, went into a bit of detail in my book on Bermuda 100, which is not out because of uh, the pandemic, so it got mm -hmm. delayed. But Admiral Samuel Lee, who was in charge of the uh, blockading squadron, he's the one tasked with landing Benjamin Butler's army at Bermuda 100, just south of Richmond. Um, this fleet, by the way, is arguably the largest of the Civil War. We're talking over 100 warships and transports carrying some 35,000 soldiers and landing them at several points. So this is a complicated operation. Lee and Butler, I don't say they have a bad relationship with each other, but they have a strictly professional one. But Lee carries out all of his objectives just fine. That said, after the landings, Lee will not risk his warships, especially when a few of them are sunk by Confederate torpedoes and uh, you know roving bands of cavalry running around with artillery. So when, when Butler would go to Lee and say, hey, can you support a, a move further up the James River? Lee would be like, not without risking my ships, which I'm not going to do. So the working relationship there, it's decent enough because the landing is successful and Lee does patrol effectively the James River, but it probably maybe Lee could have done a little more. Uh, but anyway, so that's with the Union. With the Confederates, it's a bit more tricky. The Confederate fleet was kept separate, and there were coordination problems between the Confederate general uh, Mansfield Lovell, who's the commander at New Orleans, and the river forces that he had. Then Jefferson Davis sent a large number of the river forces north towards Island Number 10 because he was actually more afraid of that than the Union Navy coming from the south. You don't have too many attempts at joint operations, but they do happen occasionally, such as the Arkansas was supposed to help out with the capture of Baton Rouge. That didn't work out, though. But then on the bayous and the Red River, you did have Army generals who essentially commissioned their own gunboats, which would give direct support. Probably your best example of um, successful Confederate Navy and Army Corps cooperation is the capture of Plymouth, North Carolina using CSS Albemarle. CSS Albemarle, decent little ironclad, sinks and chases off a small Union flotilla outside Plymouth. The Confederate Army then surrounds the city. Albemarle, of course, fires at the city throughout the attack, and then Plymouth is captured. Um, so I would say with the Confederates, it wasn't for lack of trying, but they didn't have as many opportunities to really coordinate between forces. Well, I suppose that makes sense. Um, I do, I, I do kind of like the idea of various generals just going, ah, well, we do not have sufficient uh, river river boats to do what I want. I shall commission my own personal gunboat. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's how it might be a captured ship. That was that was a big deal in Western Louisiana because the uh, the Confederates there were, I mean, they're few in number. Resource. I mean, if you think resources are stripped down in the rest of the Confederacy, Western Louisiana is like uh, it's like it's like a Mad Max movie in some ways. Uh, <laughs> You know, but um, that that the Union the Union Army did the same thing too. So Benjamin Butler, when he did the Bermuda Hundred campaign, he also had Army commissioned gunboats for a fleet of uh, about eight or nine warships, and he put them under command of a man named Charles Graham, who before the war served in the U.S. Navy, joins the Army during uh, the Civil War, and he uh, commanded a brigade at Gettysburg. So, you know, Butler's thinking, here's a guy who understands land and naval operations he'll be my personal fleet commander the only problem is those ships that graham has are not particularly powerful and the one time they were used offensively it did not work out which was the attack on fort clifton actually graham lost one of his ships uh one fun fact though the union did put soldiers on 
the Mississippi River Flotilla. This is called the Mississippi Marine Brigade. Mm -hmm. And so the point of them is that they will defend the ship from Confederate snipers. They can land and say raid or, uh, you know, maybe like burn a position or something. Or if you just need troops in an emergency area, like if the Confederates are attacking some of the garrisons along the river, you can land these Marines there. The Mississippi Marine Brigade, it was very much a success and really shows how the uh, Mississippi River and Army operations worked together very effectively. I suppose that helps. <laughs> you don't want, you don't want yeah, to end up with yeah. one or the other side isolated. I suppose the worst case scenario would be if you, uh, if you advanced your troops because if you advance your ships too far, you can always fall back down the river. Whereas if you advance your troops too far and you end up with the enemy's river flotilla sitting there wondering what, what all the mysterious people in the, on the other side's uniforms are in, <laughs> you're going to have to be withdrawing under heavy naval gunfire, which is probably going to hurt. Yeah, that, that, will, that, that never happened just because the Confederate fleets aren't strong enough for it. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, it could happen in, it could happen in theory, but... They, they, the Union, when they're working on the, on the rivers, especially Mississippi, Tennessee, and Cumberland, they always make sure to have naval support close at hand. Hmm. You know? Yeah. So, yeah, they'll always have naval support close at hand. Very early on, McClellan, Henry Halleck, these generals, they're, they're heavily criticized today for some good reasons. One thing both men understood was the value of river and naval transport and naval gunfire support. And it should be noted, both of those men are excellent strategists, especially McClellan. I think that's actually McClellan's true calling was as a strategist. Fair enough. <laughs> Which is probably a, about the most positive thing you usually hear said about him. Usually. There, there are people who are reassessing uh, McClellan, uh, mm -hmm. especially Ethan Steprafus, uh and trying to understand what McClellan was trying to achieve. It should also be kept in mind that a lot of our views of McClellan are a product of Lincoln's two secretaries, Nicolay and Hay. They wanted to write a biography of Lincoln that would essentially make him a saint. And so they wrote their memoirs of Lincoln, if you will, Lincoln biography. And they decided to make not Jefferson Davis, but George McClellan the villain of Lincoln's Civil War story. And they did this on purpose. You can see in their letters... They're talking about how they're going to portray him as a buffoon. Mm -hmm. And I think that really went back to George Washington because you had guys like George Bancroft, who was a historian uh, from before the Civil War, wrote a lot of your early works on George Washington. He didn't make the British George Washington's true enemy. He made Washington's true enemy Horatio Gates and Charles Lee, the two generals under him. I think they were really kind of working in that tradition. Um, so I, I'm not saying McClellan was a military genius, am saying that the portrayal of him as this overly cautious buffoon is grossly inaccurate. The man is a very good engineer and a superb strategist. Okay, well, fair enough. Um, yeah. I suppose we'll, we, we shall see how history uh, re reinterprets him in the future. <laughs> so yeah, they're, they're, they'll never, he'll, I don't think he'll ever be beloved or anything no. by historians. But I, I will say that Right now, there's, there's certainly a more nuanced view of McClellan's position in the war, mm -hmm. why he failed. Um, yeah, not to derail us too much, but just I, I do think yeah. that there is... Uh, I, I do think there's... I, I, I can't say there's been some like reassessment, and now he's a genius, of course, but I think a lot of historians are more sensitive to the position he was in and are more willing to concede that he was right about X, Y, and Z. You know? Yeah. Uh, but that said, he's yeah. definitely a commander with considerable flaws too. <laughs> so, so with with uh, with that in mind, obviously you've got the the as we said, we've got the commanders on the rivers, got the commanders on land, different levels of competence, different levels of equipment as well. I guess. Um, how closely fought were these river campaigns, and were there sort of any periods where the Confederacy had ascendancy over the Union in a theater, or or vice versa? Which obviously the Union wins the war in the end um oh, yeah. but what, what was it kind of uh was there kind of a period were there periods where you had the union wasn't able to advance because the confederates were strong enough to control parts of the rivers um and maybe dominated those sections or was it always a case of the confederacies on the back foot and their river forces are basically just trying to stem the tide 
Confederacy is always on the back foot as far as, far as the ship to ship conflict would go. <laughs> the Confederates, though, did very quickly uh, figure out that the best way to uh, to hold back the Union is to have a fortified position with bluffs. Now, to explain how this works, you have to consider how the rivers are and the nature of the warships. So what I mean is, okay, you've got these ironclad gunboats coming out. Their debut is Fort Henry. Now, Fort Henry is the main fort to control the Tennessee River. The Tennessee River, by the way, is not an easy one to defend because the Tennessee River doesn't have a lot of bluffs. I mean, its bluffs it has are relatively slight as well. Fort Henry is placed where it is because the Confederates need a fort as far north in the Tennessee River as they can manage. The spot was chosen because it had a good field of fire. You could fire far down the river itself when the Union came at you. The problem is it's a low-lying area, so when the Union fleet by, uh, underfoot shows up to Fort Henry, part of Fort Henry's already submerged. And most of your Confederates considered Fort Henry an engineering mistake. You know, outside of its decent field of fire, it's in a bad position. Now, the Fort's garrison puts up a pretty heroic fight. They actually did damage one of Foote's guns, but in the end, Fort Henry falls. When that occurs, there is suddenly a kind of gunboat fever, if you will. And Foote uh, was a bit reluctant to go after Fort Donaldson right away. And there's a fun story. Now, one thing fun, good thing about Foote is uh, Foote was a deeply, deeply religious man. I mean, this guy says, praise the Lord in his official reports. He had a uh, relative, I think it was his niece, who goes up to him after church and says to him, uh, like, uncle, put your faith in God and gunboats. And so that kind of pressure means from people and even his own family makes Foot go, okay, we're going to try Fort Donaldson. Fort Donaldson's a fiasco. Foot is lucky that he doesn't lose at least two of his warships. And that's because Fort Donaldson is on a bluff. And I've been to Fort Donaldson. You can't go to Fort Henry. It's underwater, completely underwater now. But I've been to Fort Donaldson. It's got a great field of fire. You have plunging fire. Remember, those city-class gunboats aren't armored on the top. And you can take out their steering quickly. So Foote's fleet is soundly beaten at Fort Donaldson. In fact, one of the, one of the Confederates in Fort Donaldson got on the parapet and yelled at the ships, you are not at Fort Henry. <laughs> and yeah, before that happened, by the way, your Union army that's surrounding Fort Donaldson were simply kicking back and being like, okay, we'll just wait for the gunboats to do it. They weren't even fortifying. They were barely probing the Confederate lines. They're just like, yeah, whatever, we'll just surround the place. The foot will take out the fort, and then we've got it. And now things are much different. Of course, a bitter land battle is fought. They're one the Confederates almost win. And another, another thing with this would be Fort Jackson and St. Philip. Now, Jefferson Davis and Mallory were more afraid of what was happening on the north side of the river, you know, Memphis, Island Number 10. They figured that New Orleans was secure because of those two forts. To be fair, those are two very large forts that were well-maintained before the war. But you have PGT Beauregard, who was not in charge in Louisiana, unfortunately, for the Confederates, that is. Beauregard was a brilliant engineer. And he very early on said, you know, Farragut, he was kind of analyzing, he's like, you know, Farragut's going to come at you with a wooden fleet. You think that these forts are going to be take those wooden ships out. He says, but they are now steam powered. So Beauregard very much was like, Farragut can just run the guns, which is what happens. Now New Orleans is put under, can under uh, the cannons are pointed at it. The city has no choice but to surrender. Now we're talking naval gunfire. The Confederate army and the militia units that were at New Orleans actually did have one final defensive line they tried to man that had some light cannons on it. The Union Navy opened up on them, and within a few minutes, the entire force fled. But anyway, so... Farragut proved that wooden warships could succeed against forts if you had steam power. Yeah. So for the Confederates, yeah. it becomes a case of you can't just have like a fortified position. You got to have a fortified position on a bluff, which is what they get with Vicksburg and Port Hudson. And controlling those two points allows them to extend their control of the Mississippi River. And the real advantage of that is not only do you get the supplies from the Trans Mississippi. But the Union can't use the Mississippi River to ship goods out from the Midwest. And while the railroad was definitely supplanting the steamboat by this time, a lot of people still relied on steamboats. 
the Midwest is where Abraham Lincoln, the Republican Party, is most vulnerable. That's where people are least excited about emancipation, for instance. Uh, so controlling the river is also very important politically, should be kept in mind. Mm-hmm. And so the Confederates, yeah. by having Port Hudson and Vicksburg with their large garrisons, their cannons on bluffs, are able to interdict the Mississippi River for a much longer than they should have, especially after Island Number 10 and New Orleans had fallen. Um, the Tennessee River, given the fact that it didn't have many bluffs and the one fort that was on it failed, the Tennessee River essentially becomes Union-controlled territory for the war. Same thing with the Cumberland. That's, of course, once the main forts there fall. Red River stays in Confederate hands, but a lot of that has to do less with Confederate efforts and more just with the geography and the, and the area's importance being less so as the war goes on. The James River, though, is the fascinating one. Because the James River, where it gets very, very wide, the Union can very quickly and easily establish control. But it gets narrow very quickly. Now, in 1862, when McClellan is driving on Richmond and comes within about, I want to say, about 20 miles of the city, there was a Union naval attempt to run the guns and get to Richmond, or at least take out the fortifications there at Drury's Bluff. They failed. Those fortifications are on a river bluff. You've got that. The Confederates build a decent little fleet at Richmond, and they place lots of defensive obstacles and lots of torpedoes, including the experimental torpedoes that had double charges on them as well. Mm-hmm. James River is really one place where I would argue the Confederates are in many ways truly ascendant almost to the very end of the war because they're able to control the most vital part of the James River. Uh, yeah, for almost the entire conflict. And keep in mind, you know, if Drury's Bluff falls or something, you can, you can put Richmond under, th- under threat almost right away, and that would be a catastrophic blow. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so there you go. I think I think the James River is really the one where they did well, but also the geography favored them too. And resources. I mean, you're right at Richmond. Richmond is one of the best manufacturing base in the entire Confederacy. So you I mean Richmond can actually make its own cannon, for instance. So yeah. Richmond Richmond's able to you you're able to produce what you need to defend the river right at your doorstep. Which is pretty handy considering that as you say, there's not a lot of manufacturing base in the confederacy generally uh given given how many how many uh confederate navy officers were incredibly happy to discover that many of the guns had survived the capture of norfolk and yes how key <laughs> they were um i will say they did start to build up more of a uh, of a manufacturing base in the heartland of the south particularly <laughs> uh central alabama and georgia and that's actually why the civil war naval museum is in uh, like south, is like in Georgia on the uh, Georgia Alabama border. <laughs> um, oh God, what city is that? It and again, Columbus, Columbus, Georgia, uh, which I plan to uh, go by there sometime and check out that museum for sure. Mm-hmm. Okay, so with with all of this um, in mind. Was there kind of a tipping point in the River Wars where it became, where it went from sort of a little bit of back and forth and sort of panic here and there whenever someone came out with a new ironclad to th- this is pretty, obviously we said the Confederates were on the back foot most of the time, but was there a point where it went from we're on the back foot but we can scare them and hold them up to uh, sort of union union ships everywhere just run away and fall back and fall back and fall back? <laughs> One of the, the the real decisive moments, of course, I mean, you have the the gunboat scare, if you will, from Fort Henry, but that doesn't last mm-hmm. too long. Island number 10 holds up fairly long considering its position, but in the end it falls too. Uh, I, I, I would say on the one hand, the fall of New Orleans is your key one because this takes out the main port from which you can build ships. And New Orleans, while not, a manufacturing city like a northern one does have ways to manufacture things. That's taken out. And when New Orleans falls, there's essentially nothing between New Orleans and, uh, honestly, all the way to Fort Pillow. Vicksburg has to be set up as a fortified position almost as an emergency. Um, so I would say the decisive moments for the Mississippi is the fall of New Orleans 
And then, of course, when the Confederates are able to set up their fortified positions where the Navy's like, look, we will not be able to take out Vicksburg and Port Hudson. They can only be taken out through a prolonged major military campaign. And both those campaigns are quite bloody. Vicksburg and Port Hudson are very easy places to defend. Uh, one of my favorite little stories about Port Hudson is when the Union Army is marching towards that position, there was actually a sign that said, this way to hell. And they were <laughs> kidding. Oh, they, they were kidding. Port Hudson, uh, I want to say there are 10,000 Union casualties at Port Hudson. 5,000 of those are deaths by disease, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, the Union assaults in Port Hudson are bloody, bloody failures. Um, you know, the city can only fall because it is surrounded, and then it only and, and even then it gives up because Vicksburg gives up. They probably get held up a little bit longer, but at that point it was like, ah, it's kind of pointless, you know. Um, decisive moment for the James River operations. You not only have the fact that that Drury's Bluff holds up, but then you have another key thing. This kind of goes to McClellan, so getting some land command stuff, if you will. All right, so McClellan very early on says, "I want to do the Peninsula campaign, get in some ships." We'll just land right next door to Richmond and, and besiege the place. This, by the way, is Robert E. Lee's nightmare scenario. This is what he's most afraid of. The Confederacy is most afraid of the peninsula approaches being used. So McClellan's chosen the exact right strategy. However, that strategy fails for a number of reasons. Some because McClellan's not the best battlefield commander. Some of it's also because he's not getting proper support from Abraham Lincoln and especially from Secretary of War Edwin Stanton, who openly despises McClellan. When I say openly despises him, he chose McClellan's core commanders for him, and he only chose men who didn't like McClellan. So there you go. <laughs> what a charming man, right? So anyway, um, when the peninsula approaches are abandoned, with that goes a lot of Union naval activity on that river. And so in many ways, a decisive thing for the James River is the fact that the Union didn't start to use it again until 1864, when Grant, of course, goes overland and then finds himself at the James River and essentially takes Petersburg and Richmond in a campaign that McClellan had conceived of. <laughs> um, so for those, uh, those are the important ones. As far as the Tennessee and the Cumberland go, I mean, once Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson fall, that's pretty much it. You know, right. one, of the problems the, by the one, one of the problems with Tennessee and the Cumberland as opposed to Mississippi is at a certain important point, they both become very hard to navigate. The Cumberland's mm -hmm. fairly narrow by the time you even get to Nashville. And the case of the Tennessee River, it starts to get very hard to navigate when you get to Alabama. So even though the Tennessee River goes all the way to Chattanooga, the Union could never do a true naval campaign aimed at Chattanooga. It just wasn't possible. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. So... We, um, what would the implications have been for losing control of a river or, or more had that happened on either side as in sort of complete loss of control? Let's say there was a, I don't know, a massive storm yeah. or a particularly dramatic battle. Um, obviously, it's, it's easy to point out um, with the Union winning historically that if the Confederates had lost all their ships on one river, which would have ended quicker. But I suppose maybe the more interesting thing is what would have happened if for some reason the union had lost the majority of its ships on a river on a river thus giving the confederacy supremacy on the river whilst the obviously on land the troop situation is not that that much changed the one that happens on the red river almost where that fleet is captured is i think one of the i don't know it actually did i think it's of all the people we'll talk about what ifs or hypotheticals for the civil war that's the least discussed one and in some ways the most important one the Confederates then could have captured, I mean, they have to repair it, of course, but they will then have at their fingertips a first-class fleet of ironclads. That would have been some real hell for the Union. Uh, they would have had to build a whole other set of warships, sent more troops over. should also be mentioned that if they had captured those ships, they would have also captured the Union Army on the Red River, which numbered about twenty to 30,000 men. So this would have been a major blow. And obviously, all those men would have come with equipment. Um, and oh, presumably, yeah. yeah. So, so presumably, they're supply ships as well who are bringing up sort of bulk supplies, oh. food, and ammunition. Supply ships, definitely. Now, one thing you should keep in mind you're, as far as weapons go, except for early in the war, the Confederates are actually fairly well armed. Um, 
they're able to manufacture them of their own guns. They import ones, of course, the Enfield, the Lorenz, which is the Austrian rifle. So the Confederates really um, weren't, in, at least in the infantry level, weren't inf inferiorly armed. Artillery-wise, Union primers were better, and Union artillery was generally better. But Confederate artillery was competitive, and there are a few battles where I would even argue Confederate artillery was superior, especially uh, Shiloh and Chancellorsville. But anyway, so, yeah, getting those ships, though, they have Confederates have no way to build the kind of ships they could have captured on the Red River. That would have been a, that, that would have been one hell of a, I don't know if it would have been decisive necessarily. The Union can still build ships to replace what they've lost, but that would have been fascinating. Uh, and <clears throat> at that point, losing control of the Mississippi River, or at least having the Confederates able to interdict traffic on it more effectively, that kind of a big influence in the way the Midwest goes. Because remember, that's where Lincoln's most vulnerable. Your 1864 election for president, it's him versus McClellan. Now, McClellan is a war Democrat who wants to fight the war. He makes that very clear. He's actually the only U.S. presidential candidate to reject his party's platform because the Democratic Party's platform called for peace. McClellan said, I'm not for peace. We will prosecute this war until it's victorious. That said... Any kinds of demoralization the North is going to feel is going to increase quite a bit in Mississippi Falls, and especially because it would affect where Lincoln is most vulnerable, the Ohio and Mississippi River Valleys. Um, now, as far as the Tennessee, there's really no chance on that one. The Cumberland, <clears throat> um, the only real way that could happen is if the Confederates take Nashville, and then they'd have to set up a four to five position upriver. So once again, that's very difficult. The James River is kind of interesting. The Even though the Confederates controlled the most important part, there were some efforts in 1864 to try to blockade the uh, the parts of the river was wider. The only problem with that is that the Confederates lacked the guns to do it, and Jefferson Davis was not very supportive of the idea. So whatever chance the Confederates had of trying to interdict traffic on the James River was, if they even had a chance, was frittered away in June of 1864. Um, but yeah, the Confederates lost control of James. Uh, in my opinion, it's over after that. The Confederacy can't handle, especially early in the war, cannot handle the fall of its capital. And they cannot handle the fall of the manufacturing base that's in Richmond. You know? Yeah, well, they're um, kind of the, the two linchpins early on, as you say, before they start distributing... Uh, before they start distributing skills and industry across the across the confederacy yeah yeah and and even then richmond's obviously your best manufacturing center they have and um yeah the, there's also i mean even later in the war because some people will be like oh lee's army's the target i'm like well they can't really destroy lee's army given the terrain and the fact the union doesn't have cavalry set up for pursuit because that's not the way u.s but, cavalry was set up it was set up for patrol and dragoon work mm -hmm. i mentioned that because even if Richmond does fall in 1864, that's a tremendous blow. I mean, Richmond has defied several Union attempts to take it. You know, on to Richmond had oftentimes been the call. So a Confederate failure on the James River would have been catastrophic. Um, if the Confederates had managed to at least interdict traffic on the James River, like Beauregard wanted to do in 1864, it's debatable how effective that could have been. Um... I would probably say not really. They don't really, they, you'd, you'd have to set up a fortified position very quickly, set up your cannons, and then also repel what would probably be a considerable land attack to take that fortified position. Um, but yeah, the, uh, the Mississippi River, that would have been the big what if if they get a fleet in 1864. Obviously, the, the war ends, spoilers, the Union won. Um, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> shockingly. Um, <laughs> The uh, what happened to all these river forces at the end of the American Civil War? Because uh, I I know from obviously my sort of more oceanic side of of things that the U.S. or the Union Navy, I should say, when it goes back to being the U.S. Navy, it's it comes out of the American Civil War with this massive number of of warships, and then Congress decides that effectively the, the the navy's budget for the next decade is going to be three nickels one dime and a quarter and they have to share the quarter with the army and so the fleet basically just gets 
cut down by over 90% and what's left starts to rust away in port. Is this pretty much the same thing with the river forces or is it better or is it possibly even worse? Oh God, I mean, like if, if from a purely military point of view, so much worse. They're demilitarizing these ships as fast as they can, sell them off. And to be fair, you've won. What's the point of a river fleet? And let's say arguably the Confederates rise up again and rebel, which was a real fear after the war with the political tensions going mm -hmm. on. They just build a new one, right? <laughs> uh, and if anything, the Confederate industrial base is more wrecked than it was in 1861. So <laughs> if you had naval supremacy during the last war, you're going to have it even in spades this time. Um, so decommissioned very, very quickly. I haven't run any of these warships that were kept around. Um, that said, fun to think about some of the ones that sank, of course. Mm -hmm. I know that the CSS Louisiana was discovered embedded in the mud through uh, some kind of uh, sonar radar scan, whichever one I can't remember exactly right now. I think a sonar scan on it on the Bob Mississippi River. Uh, they did raise the Cairo and mm -hmm. partially reconstructed it, and you can check it out at um, uh, Vicksburg uh, National Military Park. Another one, the uh, I forget the name. I think it's CSS Tallahassee, I want to say, was found and raised and is on display. What's left of it is on display at the uh, Civil War Naval Museum in Columbus, Georgia. So it's I've always thought it's kind of funny because, you know, your average warship gets scrapped. So in some ways, the ones that sink are really the ones that stick around, right? Yeah, because then the, by the time anyone finds them again, they're old enough that people are actually interested in them again. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the Imperial Japanese Navy, uh, all those ships are scrapped after World War II. I don't think any of them were kept around. I think one or two of them ended up in like foreign service, right? Uh, but eventually those are scrapped too. But yeah, I mean, if you um, if you got a deep sea submersible and you want to go find the carrier here, you, um, it's still there mm -hmm. somewhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's one of the ones you have for the River Navy. And also keeping in mind, a number of these ships were civilian ships to begin with. So, of course, there's going to go back to working transports. I'm sad to say that outside of those two that sank, mm -hmm. I don't know of any Civil War naval ship you can go visit the way you can visit, say, um, uh, you have HMS Belfast in London, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And we have a variety of World War II ones here, mostly Essex-class carriers, you know, but the USS Kidd, uh, Fletcher class destroyers mm -hmm. right over here at Baton Rouge. I've been on board. USS Texas, of course. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so yeah, so no, no, no ships you can visit either. You can't go hang out on a monitor or anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that there's a replica of monitor, isn't there? Um, I think there that they built be. somewhere. There is a replica of the Hunley, the uh, submarine that. <laughs> uh, that uh, was used. <laughs> I think I'd probably want to pathologically stay away from any physical contact with that ship or any replica <laughs> thereof. One of the things I, I tell you, the, the one of the fascinating things to me about Hunley was that they found that gold piece in Dixon's mm -hmm. pocket. And I'm doing all this research on Shiloh, and the Dixon's gold piece saves his life at the Battle of Shiloh because it catches a bullet. And that story was repeated in several newspapers at the time. And some people questioned it because, of course, you know, that's a kind of, I hate saying this phrase, if you will, but kind of like a cornball story that people would have loved at the time. Some people were like, oh, who knows if it happened? And it's like, no. If, when they found, when they unearthed the Hunley, there was the gold piece, just as he said. So that was nice. pretty cool. Like that. Yeah. And I believe it's on, I wasn't able to see it when I went to Charleston, but I believe it's on display at a museum there. You know, if yeah. we go back to Charleston, I definitely want to check out the gold piece. <laughs> Stay yeah. away from Hunley, though. <laughs> yeah, because I think if I touch it, it'll probably sink. Even though there's virtually, it's like people are like, "How did this happen?" It's like, "No, well, no, it, it sunk still." <laughs> Wait, uh, did, they, did they find any remains of the uh, the ship it sank? Which, um, like, what was the name of the ship that it sank? Was it Housatonic? Housatonic, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, did they find any remains for that boat? I don't know. I'd have to look into it. Um, I suspect, to be honest, I suspect as a wooden ship, and given the era that it sank in, it, if they, if it wasn't salvaged, any components that were left would probably have been um, either broken up, carried away, or buried by the currents. Yeah, I, 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 I wondered if you find cannons from it or something, you know, and maybe they did salvage 
Thanks, Herman. I don't even know exactly how deep uh, that one sank in. I'm, I'm going to look that one up now. But yeah. of course, yeah. you know, Monitor was discovered. Mm -hmm. um, uh, actually, CSS Tennessee was found too, and apparently in good condition because the mud essentially is preserving the boat. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, no, that's yeah, the. I have, uh, I have been... Go ahead. I was just, I was just going to say, I've noticed actually that's the case in that a lot of the. A lot of the U.S. rivers, and I got a lot of feedback uh, about this um, when uh, back when we were discussing USS Texas, with a lot of people pointing out that for various reasons, the U.S. a lot of U.S. rivers, by the time you get to sort of the estuaries and and the river mouths, they're actually relatively acidic, to the point that one of the major reasons that Texas's hull seems to have so many problems is because the river is, in that area is basically eating the steel a lot more than ironically than it would be even if, if either if it was in fresh water further up or if it was out at sea <laughs> which is saying something yes. considering how corrosive salt water is but at the same time a lot of the ships that get stuck in mud as you say the mud generally seems to have a fairly preservative effect which is is I mean, it's not unheard of, generally speaking, but it is a little bit unusual to have it so preserve, have sort of have such preservative properties. I was, um, I was struck by the pictures that have been coming out recently from USS North Carolina, where um, the ships effectively settled into the mud, and they're they're replating wow. it um, now that they've managed to drain the area around it. But actually, for a ship that is been stuck in a mud what's effectively its own mud bank for a good long while and obviously that the steel has degraded to a certain point it's not degraded any to anywhere near the extent that texas has yeah no i, did, I didn't even in north carolina settle in the mud but i haven't had a mm. chance to go to that one which i really want to it's yeah it's a uh, north carolina I, I, wash my favorite battleships I, I think it's a case with North Carolina of the mud has come to it, so they're kind of they moored it in oh. a nice little, nice little not well, not secluded, but quieter part of the river, and then just over time, as the rivers brought mud down, it's just built up and up and up and up. Ah, uh, um, right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I do. I do want to mention one last thing about yeah. the American Civil War, the naval aspect. I, okay. I, I do believe there is one crucial uh, legacy of the war. Mm -hmm. Is the importance of the Army Navy cooperation. Uh, partially because the they had such good cooperation during the conflict, mm -hmm. but also because the times did break down. It would be something like Vicksburg in 1862, where Farragut can't take a position. And that is considered one of the U.S. Navy's real, uh, like we say, like that's, uh, that's considered one of their biggest disappointments in the war, the one they really beat mm -hmm. themselves up over with both during and after the conflict. So I do want to mention that because I do think that's important for uh, U.S. Army Navy relations. Of course, there's always some inter-service rivalry, but uh, in the Civil War, it's more a case of the U.S. Navy and the U.S. Army working very well together. You know, hmm. so I think that was the real. Uh, I think that was the the uh, the real legacy of that because they didn't really have. That's something I want to mention real quick. They didn't really have a tradition of doing that before the Civil War. The Navy, yeah. of course, had blockaded Mexico, but I mean, hell, um, you know what? That one naval operation. In the American Revolution, the one in Maine is at Penobscot mm -hmm. Bay. Uh, it's like the worst showing of an American fleet until Pearl Harbor, I guess. And in that case, they took us by surprise. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, you know, so there really wasn't this tradition of them working together. So it's it's pretty impressive achievement in some ways. Anyway, I'm yeah. done. Thank you for having okay. me on. Thank you very much, and uh, may, hopefully we'll ha we'll do this again at some point because there's plenty more to talk about when it comes to the American Civil War and naval matters. <laughs> oh, oh, most certainly, most yeah. certainly. And I believe you mentioned um, at some point that you have a book either out or due to be out, or possibly both. Yeah, yeah, I have the uh, Battle of Petersburg, which doesn't deal with naval matters in particular. Mm -hmm. uh, that was published years back. I have two books that are supposed to be published this year. One of the Bermuda Hunter campaign, which involves a lot of the Navy. And mm -hmm. then, of course, Beauregard, who himself was an advocate, like we said, for torpedo boats and submarines. Both those are delayed by the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, my main thing I'm working on right now is on Shiloh and also a smaller book on Forts Henry and Donaldson. Okay. Um, 
yeah, so maybe two books. Navy is very important in that as well. Um, and beyond that, I also write for the uh, write some episodes for the YouTube channel Forgotten Battles. So that's what I'm up to. Okay, cool. I, I, I'm I'm a subs I'm subscribed to Forgotten Battles, so uh, that's always good to know. Um, we'll have a we'll have a we'll have, a, we'll have Mons Grappus coming up real soon. <laughs> oh, that sounds interesting. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, do, do, is there a release date on those latter two books, or is it just sort of on hiatus until? You know, the the the, the two that I have, I mean, they're done. I've actually, I literally looked at the proof of the Bermuda 100 book, and it was going mm -hmm. to be published. I mean, it's going to go into the printer two weeks before they said it can't. And that's because yeah. those books rely a lot on sales at the national parks. The national parks said all sales are frozen this year. Right. Uh, which I've actually heard means they're running out of stock because people are going to the national parks a lot right now mm -hmm. because they can't do anything else. Uh, yeah. So the parks are actually <laughs> rather. So hopefully they're going to say like, okay, we'll buy some books next year and then Bermuda 100 will come out right away. So I think sometime next year for both books. Uh, mm -hmm. Shiloh, uh, that, that's a few years off, but it's, it's going to be a good one. I'm putting a lot of work mm -hmm. into this one. Well, what I'll do is um, I'll put a link in the video description for the book you've got out at the moment. And um, well, as and when you, we have a release date for the other two, let me know. And I'll, I'll let pop those into an announcement at, uh, at the relevant point when they're close to release in the future. Oh, certainly. So, um, yeah. Thank you very much for coming on. And uh, obviously, there's probably going to be a lot of editing going into this one because we had a complete separate conversation afterwards. <laughs> um, well, what do you you want to do with that just make it like a bonus thing or something i i, um, I tend to love I tend to love tangents you know <laughs> yeah I, I i i might split out some uh, to be honest i might split out some of it for um a separate video especially the stuff about the the sort of american navy immediately before and after the civil war because i'm trying okay. to put together a, i'm trying to put together a body of 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 recordings for the american civil war and that'll probably sit quite nicely in a kind of a, a an, an okay. overall look over this is kind of this is where it sat in contact with the rest of the world. Um, so I think that'll work pretty well. Um, All right. So, yeah. Okay. So th thank you very much, everyone, for listening. And I hope to see you again in another video. And then I hit. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.